Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back on Community Matters, but actually we're doing a two-part show. We're doing a, a two-part show about Sinclair Broadcasting Group, which is in the news a lot. And in fact, at 12 noon, uh, Tim, uh, Tim uh, Apicella um, did a show uh, with our host, our host for two shows, Brett Opergaard, Associate Professor of Journalism, School of Communications at UH Manoa, who cares about this a lot, um, about propaganda and fake news in Sinclair Media. And now, uh, and so you identified the problem in the last show, and I'd like to follow that, you know, the caboose, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, and talk about what the solutions might be. But first, can you summarize what happened in the first show so we get the landscape? Sure. Uh, Jay, what I think what Brett and I discussed was, A, what, what recently occurred that created this firestorm of concern about Sinclair Broadcasting Group and how they made the anchors read a script word for word across the country. So that was kind of the, 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 the beginning of this whole thing. And then we talked about what is Sinclair? How big is Sinclair? And how big do they want to become? And they want to acquire a Tribune Media and make it even larger. Um, so we talked about the nature of Sinclair Broadcasting Company and, and what its goals are, what it appears to be the goals. I suppose a good question to ask before we get into possible solutions is, suppose there is no solution, what happens? What happens if they acquire a Tribune? Uh, what happens if they're permitted to do whatever they want in this arena? What happens to the country? Brett? Well, I think, it, I mean, it's a likely scenario that you know, money talks and there's no real uh, guard here protecting public interests. So what we're going to be dealing with here is a uh, media sphere with less people having more influence and their message getting larger and larger and, and less diversity of opinions and diversity of information for um, the public to have in their hands. Yeah, that's why you called it propaganda in the last show. Mm -hmm. Not only fake, but propaganda, mm -hmm. uh, which means one person can control the, the thinking of many people. Mm -hmm. We had that in, in Germany uh, and other Russia. dictatorships, Russia, mm -hmm. where the news was controlled. People only got, you know, what the dictator wanted them to hear. And boy, that's really a scary parallel to right now. So let's talk about possible things that can be done to stop this onslaught onto the First Amendment, on, on the news, on the, what do you want to call it, the news education of the public and the electorate and therefore on the Constitution, which is, seems to be more, you know, jeopardized every day. Wow. Yeah. All, all the loopholes are being, you know, uh, dove into. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the solutions. I mean, I, and I'll identify them. I'd like to know what you guys think about these solutions, whether you have other solutions, and whether these solutions work, or we're back to Brett's original answer, well, it just gets worse and worse. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that, that's the default position here. That's what we're facing, you know? Well, I mean, one interesting uh, scenario that uh, has, has been kind of bouncing around in my mind is there's always been this talk like, how do you get real change in politics in America? And that's to bring a very divisive, polarizing candidate to the forefront. And Trump, Trump basically is the um, you know, embodiment of what this this uh, proposal would be like, like bring the most radical, um, offensive to one side of the, the equation party or person to the forefront and let them do all sorts of damage and then see does that actually uh, inspire and get people off their couches to protect yeah. democracy or are we just going to let it yeah. go? Yeah. And I, I think this Sinclair thing has some parallels to that. If, yeah. If you if if everybody just sits back and lets this happen, at some point they're going to say, "Geez, I don't like this," and and you know it could be too late at that point. Hope so. Yeah. Hope they listen to this show. Yeah. You know the old slogans: what, "What doesn't kill you makes you stronger." Although sometimes what does kill you kills you. <laughs> <laughs> and in this case, it could be. It could be. Okay, well, this is not just... democracy. I mean, democracy is not a guaranteed right that we have. True it's, fact. It, it is. People in the United States especially don't appreciate how unusual this is. This is, this is the great experiment of democracy, and we've done it. 
and we've only done it for a couple hundred years. So uh, compared to all other types of governments, you know, that have lasted uh, and been tried. So um, all other attempts at democracy have eventually been extinguished by, you know, dictatorship type forces. And this is, you know, the challenge we face today. Yeah. Unfortunately, the schools aren't teaching this particular lesson. And a lot of people in this country do not understand how vulnerable it is and how we have to work to keep it. You know, it's my, my thing about Ben Franklin comes out of uh, what Independence Hall in, um, in uh, Philadelphia and a woman, it's secret what goes on inside. Woman approaches him, she says, Dr. Franklin, Dr. Franklin, what kind of government are we gonna have? <laughs> and he thinks for a second, he says, Madam, we're going to have a republic but only if you can keep it. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we still have that challenge, yeah. don't we? <laughs> okay, possible solutions. And this is not necessarily of importance or, or likelihood of success. Uh, one is, how about all those guys in the, Sinclair, in the Sinclair organization quit in protest? They quit. What happens? Uh, I think it would be a good move if they could pull it off. I just have a hard time believing that they could do that. It's... Uh, comes down to people with mortgages and kids to feed and bills to pay and um, there in in broadcast journalism there isn't a lot of safety nets for, for those folks. Yeah, and if you if you quit in in a huff from a in protest from a big company which controls a lot of media, you're not going to get a job so quick with the other branches of that company. <laughs> well, definitely not with other branches, but I, I, and it could be a situation where other media organizations hire those people as a sign of support. Yeah. So it could work out that way. Yeah. But I just don't think there's necessarily the capacity to hire all those people if they all, you know, simultaneously quit. I, I don't see how the, the system could absorb it. But yeah. I, I think that would be a great um, effort to see what would happen. And yeah. it could it could actually work, but I, I don't know if there's an organizing force or a union or something that would help that to happen. Let me, uh, let me just add that uh, if all those guys quit the same day, uh, Sinclair would have no problem in filling those jobs the same evening. <laughs> well, be, that could be true. They have 64% of the job market. That was a statistic I recently read that uh, not only do they pay better than some of these other broadcasting media companies, but they also have a majority share of, of positions open for employment. Uh, you, you get better pay to sell your soul, you know. <laughs> okay, anyway, so that's It always one. works that way. <laughs> <laughs> Another one, not necessarily more importance, um, back in the uh, early 20th century, we had the antitrust movement. Uh, what was his name now? Uh, Sinclair Lewis. <laughs> yep. Am I right? Yeah. The same name as Sinclair Radio, in the broadcasting group. <laughs> Sinclair Lewis yeah. uh, wrote a book. Uh, and I forget the title of the book, but this was about trust busting. Yeah. He revealed the, the robber barons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the federal government, Teddy Roosevelt, and uh, right in there, um, they went after the robber barons and they broke them up. We broke up the trusts. Um, and that was federal, of course, but it was led by a president and, you know, supported by a president who believed in that. And it was the right thing for sure. It was one of those fundamental building blocks of the country as we know it today, the trust busting. Mm -hmm. So could that work today? Um, is, would that be a good idea, for example, to, to break them up state by state or market by market and say you can only, you can only have one company per market? Uh, it's a great idea. I don't see anybody with a political will or political capital to pull it off. But um, I think if we just reverted back to the way media ownership was in the 90s, we would have uh, a much improved system. How, could, how was it in the 90s? Well, we, it used to be that you could have one uh, television station, one radio station, or one newspaper in a market, and then anything beyond that was, uh, you know, a, a considered monopolistic behavior. Simple. You know, you had this one, is the rule of the FCC. Yeah, you had one channel that you could have, uh, and you could have you know neighboring channels, say a hundred miles away. I don't remember the specifics of that particular uh, part, particular time period, but um, we gave it up because we drank the Kool Aid of the internet. You know that everybody was going to have access to information everywhere, and it was all all the citizen journalism was going to rise up and. And everybody was going to be engaged, um, truth tellers, and nobody was going to try to trick us or 
or steal our data <laughs> or uh, give us propaganda. We were naive, weren't we? Oh, we're so naive. Well, we couldn't and, see you know, it. Yeah. yeah, and I was, I was part of that group. You know, I, yeah. I believed in that future, but it hasn't worked out that way at all. The other thing about that is, uh, as, as time goes by, uh, there were consolidations in industry, not only in uh, media, but in so many other things. Uh, uh, one of the things I saw on the net, you know, examined all the consolidations that have happened in the past 10 or 20 years. It's remarkable. We used to have dozens of airlines. Now we have three or four. Mm -hmm. um, big banks are bigger, and there are fewer big banks. Um, Transportation, you name it. All the major industries uh, have been consolidated. Why not media, too? Of course, media is special. Media wears the badge of the Constitution and, you know, protecting our democracy. So. That the rules of merger and acquisition Monday, that's what they call it, should not, should not apply to media. We don't really want mergers and acquisitions of media. Mm -hmm. But that's what's happened. They got on the bandwagon and merged and ac acquired every day, not Monday, every day. <laughs> well, and a great untold story of this is, is the web. You know, the World Wide Web, everybody thought, oh, everybody, you know, you could, you could in, in a half hour make a website and have your information on an equal playing field with the New York Times. Well, what uh, people leave out of that story is nobody's coming to my website that I made in a half hour. They are coming to the bigger stations, and they're, those people are gobbling up all the the eyeballs. So it really, um, despite the potential, hasn't worked out the way we imagined it might. And and there have been exceptions, but for the most part, the people with the most money get the most viewers, and and they gobble readers, up everybody. And they gobble up everybody else. Yeah. So doesn't that lead to the point about facts and the validity of facts and how the facts are being filtered one way or another by uh, a media's agenda, be it political or social agenda, that the facts are being filtered? And I think people are starting to catch on to that. The viewers are starting to catch on that you're going to get a different set of facts at Fox Broadcasting versus you might get a different set of facts at M MSNBC. You know, these are two polarized different, you know, media companies. So who's reporting, who's reporting the true facts? And this idea that mergers and, you know, one or two big media companies will all have their different set of facts. Fox News is making a lot of money. And in my personal view, is telling a lot of lies. Um, and, I, and, I, and I know that there are, if you, if you put them side by side, I'm, I'm sure you've thought about this, MSNBC over here and Fox News over there, they're squawking at each other. You know, they're attacking each other. They're in their own little bubbles. They're fighting so, over the facts. And if, if you're a man on the fence or a woman on the fence, you get confused. Even if one of them, in fact, is telling the truth and the other one is not. Right. Um, so, so, I mean, I think it's, it's public confusion. And it's also got to do with education in the schools and critical thinking and a whole bunch of things that have changed in the country. Uh, where the public doesn't feel connected with the government or responsible for it, um, and they don't, they don't even vote. What a horrendous abdication that is. How can you run, um, this is rhetorical, how can you run democracy that way? No, <laughs> can't. <clears throat> so let me go on. Uh, okay, I, your point about regulation, going back to the 1990s, when, you know, multiple units, um, you know, couldn't, you couldn't pass a certain number of units, yeah. In, a, in an area that, yeah. that that was a good time. I want to respond quickly to this this rhetorical point you made. Um, a lot of the emphasis now is on the journalist side of the equation and how the journalists are responsible. The journalists really are the last bastion of defense. They're not the the foreground, the fore um, runners of what the democracy is. Those are the the government officials who are we elect to do those jobs. And so they're falling down, and, and it's like a uh, stack of dominoes, and the journalists are at the end here getting crushed and getting all the criticism when really it's starting so much earlier in the process of, of where the democracy is failing. I agree with you. And the problem is the press was sacrosanct. I can only think of Jimmy Cagney as the newspaper <laughs> editor back in the 30s and all that. Mm -hmm. I mean, strong principles, strong ethics. I think now it's corporate. And the corporate board of directors wants a, a return, as Fox News does. Um, they're not taking wooden nickels. They, they want to return to do anything, say anything to achieve that. And it really doesn't matter what the quality of journalism is to them. Um, no, it's become commodified. Yeah. And I worked for a company called Gannett uh, at one time, and I saw the corporate structure of, 
of news and they delivered us a big packet. It was called News 2000 and it was about 500 pages of how we should do our business in our local market. And it was basically designed to and, and for efficiency. You know, how could you efficiently um, make news in ways that made them the most profit? You know, how do we cut people out of the newsroom? How do we, um, you know, efficiently get diverse voices? Not because we uh, wanted these diverse voices, because it was like a tokenism type thing, where yeah. you know you had to get three people of different ethnicities to answer your question, and then you had to make sure their picture was on in the paper because you wanted to illustrate you were doing a diverse. Wow. Uh, yeah, I mean it was a, it was a whole prescription of how to do news like a, a commodity, and that's to me the, um, the the real problem with corporate ownership is like any kind of corporation, it takes all the local um, expertise, all the local interests out of the equation and puts in this bigger profit-oriented orientation. And they don't really, like, like you said, they don't really care about any particular place. They just care about you know how much these places are making money. That's very scary, Brett. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to address that comment because one of the proposed solutions of a Sinclair or any large media conglomerate that tries to influence the local news station is that local editorial leadership, the executives of that media company, have the final say of what story and content is going to be shown on that particular night at a news station. And I think that's starting to be, based on your story you just mentioned, that's being pushed aside where you know, these, these guys are not being in control of their own content and the, what the journalists are producing and they're being told, move that story aside. So they're sell propaganda. Right now we're gonna do some propaganda in a, in a small break. And it's going to be PSAs, public service announcements. We'll be right back for more with Brett Obergard and, and uh, Tim Apicella. Hi, I'm Pete McGinnis Mark, and every Monday at one o'clock, I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me, one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, and see you then. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. <music> Okay, we're back, you know, and I'm really sorry you weren't around for the break <laughs> because Brett came up with something about uh, the dominoes are already down. Can you please express that? I was just going to say that the radio stations, uh, for the most part, have already fallen in this. So if you want to see where TV's headed, that's where radio is. And essentially, um, through deregulation, the licenses have been bought up from you know, suburban or even rural areas nearby big metropolises uh, have been bought and then uh, brought into the big city and turned into something that they were never designed for, like alternative rock stations and things like that. And then when that wasn't good enough, uh, these stations have been turned into robo uh, satellites, basically, where the real show comes from a city, uh, you know, thousands of miles away that's doing. 40 shows an hour, the same person, you know, saying they're... Very efficient. Yeah, same, one, per, one person doing the morning show for 40 cities, you know, saying, hey, this is yeah. Sally from St. Louis. Hey, this is Sally from Portland. And, the, and uh, she records her little blip. They insert it in. They play the same songs. And it's just homo uh, homogenous type media everywhere. Like if you ever travel to these different cities and hear the radio shows, you'll hear the same person in different cities because it's really one person 
doing the whole shebang, and that's probably where we're headed with this TV thing. Yeah, it reminds me of the shopping centers. Go, go across the whole nation. Go to the shopping centers and see the same stores mm -hmm. in every shopping center. Great. So you hear the same thing on the radio. And with, with media, that's extremely dangerous because you think it's local. It's not local. You think this person had those thoughts, him, himself or herself. Not so. It's really like a, a, a bullhorn coming from far away, and you don't realize you're part of a, a receiving audience of millions. Mm -hmm. That's what Sinclair is doing. I don't think. I think people are basically deceived about that. Okay, more the possibility of litigation. Uh, real quick, litigation could stop what's happening. It could reverse in the federal system. Reverse what the FCC is doing on one basis or another. Um, I don't think that's likely because it's really expensive. Um, but it's possible. Maybe somebody will mount a, an attack on that in the next few weeks because the FCC is about to rule on the Tribune uh, acquisition. Mm -hmm. so th that will make it much worse than it is today. Um, okay. Another one is uh, uh, state litigation. Although I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. We had state litigation about the immigrant issue mm -hmm. with Douglas Shin. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. It's expensive to do antitrust type litigation, and uh, I don't think the Attorney General of Hawaii or most states is going to mount that attack unless they're better funded. Um, you got, uh, of course, you got co uh, congressional action, and Congress could fix this in a, in a minute. What's the chance of that now? <laughs> Not a chance. But you got to try. You know, well, you do have to try. You got to. Energize the citizens, or, you know, the citizens of this country, to say, "Write your congressman." Yeah, you gotta try. okay. Well, you got to be part of the process. Yeah. But let me let me offer this: that it's a, it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem, because um, you know, you don't have a chance about changing, you know, profound bad decisions like this um, until Congress changes uh, its membership. Mm -hmm. um, but so maybe this could happen after the midterms. But remember that these stations, Sinclair, and maybe Sinclair plus Tribune uh, have huge political effect and they're going to be speaking to political issues and races all over the country in those smaller markets. And, and so you have that, you have social media. Remember Mr. Cough Drop, Mr. Cough Drop, uh, he, he's the guy that was the social media manager for Trump's campaign in 2016. He's now, and he did very well, you know, he's the guy that interfaced with Zuckerberg, right? Mm -hmm. that it's all connected and they use social media brilliantly just like the Russians did uh, and had a big effect okay we know that um, so you know so you have now uh, he's uh, mr. cough drop is is the uh, what do you call it um, he's the campaign manager the whole he's the top guy for Trump now and it's three years before he's working his magic right now in the same way so you have that social media you have the Russians they haven't stopped you know um, and you have Sinclair and maybe the Tribune thing. So you have a huge number of, of and vectors you're forgetting here. about the biggest uh, 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 speaker in this is the Fox News. You know, they're number one channel for 15 years going. And this is, a, this is a station that bills itself as the alternative to mainstream media, but they are the mainstream media. And this is, I think what you're getting at here is that this is a completely false story that the mainstream media is liberal because the mainstream media, the number one mainstream media cable channel is Fox News. That's not liberal. The number one uh, local TV chain, Sinclair, not not liberal. This is uh, it's like a straw man that's been put up to knock down so they can they can expand this uh, hold on people. Right, and we haven't even talked about the religious right and the radio stations it owns in Hawaii and all over the country. I mean, Salem Radio right here. Well, Rush Limbaugh started Rush it all. Limbaugh. You know, Rush Limbaugh was really the catalyst for this whole idea that he made millions, if not billions, of dollars on this idea that you know people with a conservative bent need a need a voice on the radio. Yeah. And as soon as he proved that that could be a good money maker, then Fox News bought into it, and and now all these other folks have jumped on the bandwagon because this is something that sells. This is pretty, so you have various vectors all playing with each other, all interfacing, reinforcing. The same message is reaching people, will reach people, is reaching people uh, in the, all these markets from various directions. And they're hearing it multiple times from various sources. They begin to believe it. I think that's the human condition. If you hear something from multiple sources over and over again, you believe it. Repetitio mater studiorum repetition is the mother of study 
-hmm. And that's for a good reason. If you hear it over, mm -hmm. then you, you believe it. Anyway, so this is going to happen now, before November. So it's a chicken egg, isn't it? You know, we, we've got to beat this problem now in order to have a good effect in November. That's why our solutions are important, if we could make one. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is not a partisan issue. I mean, there's, there's no reason that our Congress uh, folks should be thinking about this as, oh, uh, these stations benefit my campaign, so therefore I'm going to support them. They should be thinking about what's best for the long-term health of our democracy. And if, if they're not uh, approaching it that way, that is the reason to vote them out. Yeah, it is. Well, I hope side. people yeah. understand that. Yeah. More, more possibilities, boycott. You're going to have an audience boycott. You're going to have a, an advertiser boycott. Uh, you can boycott these stations into, you know, less success. Uh, we talked about uh, SBGI, that's Sinclair Broadcasting, Broadcasting Group, Group, Inc. That's their stock symbol, trading at $29 and change today. But it's been down like that. Um, if, if we boycotted them in every way, well, they'd be down further, and maybe they'd have to reconsider what they're doing. It's a long shot, though. Well, How are you going to get people to do you know, that? Look at what happened with uh, Laura Ingraham, or Ingraham, whatever her name is. Uh, she was basically ran off the radio for her comments. And um, I think that really has an effect. If we're going to say we live in this corporate world and money uh, basically rules it, then what's our most powerful um, option? That's to affect the, the money. Yeah. The and money the boycott brand. does that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got to get the word out mm -hmm. through through media organizations other than Sinclair, I might add. <laughs> yeah, that probably wouldn't run. Okay, um, a new president would solve the problem. An impeachment and a new president, we wind not up with a Mike new Pence. FCC director, uh, chairman. Not huh? if it's Mike Pence, the new president. Uh, he Mike might Pence. follow the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't think a new president necessarily. You see more Salem broadcast stations. Yeah, more Salem. Yeah. <laughs> and he would Sinclair, but. <laughs> okay, and the last one, we needed to take a minute on this. Uh, it's the possibility, uh, what was it, of organizing an alternative, um, oh, was the proxy fight, mm. buy stock um, and go and change directors in, in uh, Sinclair, uh, or buy them, and go out and buy all the stock, and uh, so they're traded, right? It's a public company, and if you have enough money, Bill Gates might have enough money, Jeff Bezos might have enough money, buy them and, and then change their policies. No? Where's Carl Icahn when you need him? Exactly. Somebody very rich could do this and solve the problem. In the end, as you said, in the end, it's money. You mm -hmm. know, what was our what was our other big solution? Though we were talking about it. Um, well, pe people have to take charge and, and support the media that they want, yeah. and that really is what it comes down to. Whether it's through boycotts or viewership, if you um, understand what you're getting and you, you support it or not support it, that's, it's going to be on you. If nobody's watching these stations, they're not going to be in business. Um, now, it's, it's a hard road for a lot of people to go down because it means they have to actually work at the democracy. But it's also, um, if, if they want to have you know, freedoms like we have, they have to preserve them. Yeah. yeah. That's why people should support their print media online and actually subscribe because, because of web news and web, you know, media, um, they're losing money and they're going out of business. So if you really feel very strongly to this issue, go online and, and pay your $10 to the Washington Post or the New York Times or whatever one you feel kin to. I'm worried about the Honolulu Star Advertiser. Did you see the piece yesterday about uh, it, it was discovered that uh, they have listed their print facility for sale? I don't know what that means. It's pretty interesting. It is interesting. You, you need a print facility, actually, to print a newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not making money online if you've seen their website. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, the question, uh, oh, and there's one more possibility, and that is you know, with uh, Jeff Bezos or, uh, or Bill Gates or somebody like that, um, you build another Sinclair, but it's clean. And it, maybe well, it's broken up into a lot of little parts instead of one big part. Yeah. I mean, Jeff Bezos, if he bought... Sinclair, it would turn into just a flip of the same situation. Yeah. It would have the, 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 uh, the attack on this would be a liberal <laughs> chain that is taking over. Yeah. I mean, similar to what's happened with the Washington Post under his ownership. Even though he apparently has no direction involved in the, in the yeah. news production part, but 
Um, so, but would it work, do you think, to have a lot of, a lot of little Sinclairs who are, who are, you know, fresh, who do not have these agendas, who do not have these instructions and these employment agreements that require you to, you know, stay on the point? Um, you know, sort of a, a First Amendment type organization, but smaller, with no, you know, no control of the newscasters and the opinion givers. Um, would that work? A lot of them, a lot of them, hundreds of them. I think of it as, uh, you know, some people have, have um, stopped buying groceries at the big grocery stores and they go to their farmer's market. You know, this is something people could actually take action and change if they, they stop supporting um, these big conglomerates and, and, and instead of uh, going to their big chain media organization, they start supporting local ones that rise up and give them news about their local area, yeah, whatever those yeah, are, whether yeah. it's radio or TV or, or on the web, or even uh, there's a lot of print magazines that do a good job too. So um, I, I think they need to you put like their money one. where they want, where they want it, yeah. what they want, and, yeah. and, and it's going to take a kind of awareness, like a growing awareness of what, what you're ingesting in your media diet. Well, you know, it's possible that, um, you know, that uh, think tech could be part of that. Can you imagine a nation with hundreds of little baby think techs all over the country, uh, you know, all with, um, you know, a, sort of an open agenda on what you want to say, uh, freedom to, to speak and do journalism as you wish? Uh, wouldn't that be great? Hundreds of think techs everywhere proliferated, no control over editorial policy. What do you think? Uh, great idea. I mean, this is where we should go. This is the, the decentralization of media. And uh, it's, like, the, th the thing I love about coming on here is this is a, a, a place where you can have an open discussion about ideas that aren't circulated anywhere else. And you can have it at a depth that you don't get anywhere else. And that's, um, you know, something we should, we should preserve. Great to have you on the show. But let me, let me ask one final question before we say farewell uh, to this huge subject, which I'm sure we're going to cover again. Uh, is we, at the beginning of this show, you know, I asked you, um, you know, what's going to happen if we do nothing? Um, and it's possible with all of these ideas that, I hate to say it, but nothing may happen. So I'd like both of you guys to tell me whether you think in your heart, whether you think something, any one of these or something else will happen to, to blunt what is a very offensive, you know, attack on the press, more offensive than all the other attacks to date. Um, do you think something will happen, or are we going to be faced with the worst case analysis? That's yours, Tim. Yeah, all right. <laughs> and I'm ready to run with it. Vote with your pocketbook. <laughs> Vote with your viewership. Let them know that their declining stock prices are going down as a direct result of their, you know, very ill-mannered approaches to media in local markets. Okay, so vote with your pocketbook. I'll say, you know, now that, now that this issue has been raised to the level where we're having think tech shows and lots of people are publishing about it, there is, there is a good possibility that something, some monkey wrench will get thrown into this uh, deal. Now, I'm not necessarily hopeful, but I think there's a, a chance that that could happen. And it, it, will, it will involve people um, demanding that, that this doesn't, you know, take place. And see, we'll see if we're up to that task. We'll see if we're up to it. Yeah. But may I say from, from your lips, Brett, that's Brett Obergaard. From your lips, Brett, to God's ears. <laughs> Thank you, Brett Obergaard. Thank you, Tim Abichella. Great much. to have this discussion with you. We'll do it again, right? All right. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>